Hey guys, and welcome to Petrol Ped. This is a Nichols N1A, and this is a very special series of videos tracking the development process of this car from the prototype that is sat behind me all the way through to the first production cars that we will see in the next couple of months. The team behind this car have a CV to die for, and they include Steve Nichols, who was the designer of the McLaren MP44, the most successful Formula One car of all time, who worked with the great Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost. And I'm gonna be getting him on camera in this film to talk about the design ethos behind this car and also his background in motorsport. And also talking to CEO of Nichols Cars, John Minor, just about this project, because honestly, it's next level. Now then guys, let me introduce John Minot, who is CEO of Nichols Cars. I am for my soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, first thing I need to say is that is a beautiful motor car. Thank you very much. It really is much. something yeah, special. Yeah. So um, guys, we're gonna be going through a number of different videos, um, tracking the course of this car from the prototype we see behind us to mm -hmm. in a few months time, a proper rolling yes, car making hopefully. lots of noise on a racetrack, hopefully. That's right. Yes, that's so the plan. So can we kind of go back in time a little bit and, and can you give us some backstory in terms of, of where the thought behind and the ethos behind this project started? Yeah. And absolutely. then also yes. talk about some of the most incredible people you've got working on this project with you. Okay, right. Well, it's an idea I'd had for a while. I mean, I, I love cars from um, the era of the early 60s, I suppose up until... It, it, I mean, it was an era where cars were designed by eye, you know, mm. things had to look right, and that was the main criteria. And I suppose there came a point in the mid-60s where the trade-off to get downforce started to become known, that, that it was something you needed to achieve, and it, it tended to be done at the expense of aesthetics. Yeah. So you got cars that became sort of bluffer and, and grew, growing spoilers all over the place. And I, I wanted to get to just before that era where the, the cars looked absolutely beautiful, um, but they were genuine high performance racing cars and uh, powerful racing cars. I mean, everyone, uh, so may, maybe everyone knows the, uh, you know, the Can-Am era with, with big American oh, yeah. V8s and the, and the noise, the burble that yeah. they made and the- If the, not, the, the massive, get yourself to Goodwood. Yeah, the, yeah <laughs> see true. them racing around yeah, Goodwood. Yeah, and the, and the massive power that they put out. So. Um, I was looking for something which was a combination of of, of that, you know, the ability to, to to have that big V8 in the back behind me, mm. um, but also the aesthetics of the the early part of the 60s. And it, it it was mulling over in the back of my mind for a while. And I think one of the prettiest cars of the time was the McLaren M1A. Mm. And I'm, I'm, you know, I've done work with McLaren and... Um, knew Steve Nichols very well. And so having a McLaren connection seemed to be a particularly good idea. So as I say, I'd, I'd, I'd been developing the idea of, you know, we could do this, we could do that. And I particularly thought that taking the visual imagery of the M1A and applying it in a more modern way and, and making, the shape, making the shape subtly more aggressive and obviously, you know, bearing in mind what we now know about aerodynamics and so on, and, and, and in introducing features to try and counteract some of the inherent problems which would inevitably, inevitably happen if you just took a, um, an M1A and, and stuck it on a modern chassis. Mm -hmm. So all these things were going around in my mind. And, uh, and then I suppose the, the thing that really kick-started me was that I was at... Uh, um, at the Festival of Speed one year. So I saw a stand um, of a company called Gardner Douglas and they were showing um, a kit car that they made, which was a, a, a sort of, a, a not, not massively accurate replica of a, of a Lola T70, a fairly good representation. It wasn't a slavish copy, is what I'm saying, I suppose. But what they got there was something which showed that you could package two people in a shape like that, mm -hmm. um, and that they'd got a lot of the thinking that you need, or, and the things that you needed to overcome. 
um, in order to do the sort of car that we're doing now. Um, they'd spent quite a lot of time um, preparing the ground, if you like. So um, I had a chat with um, a chap called Andy Burrows, who owns Gardner Douglas, and he was incredibly helpful. But that, that was the turning point, and, and uh, I had then had a talk with Steve again and uh, said, look, I think we can really do this, you know, and, and wouldn't it be a good idea, wouldn't it be fun to do it? Um, and so, yeah, we, we thought the easiest thing is to build one, you know, rather than just, um, you know, talk about it. You know, yeah. Let's see how it turns out. Yeah. So um, that's basically how the project started. And... So that was it. So we, we, we started to get people saying, look, you know, are you going to be making these? And, yeah. and the response really has been incredible. And, and that's put us on the, the path that we're now on to uh, um, do something. I mean, this one, the, the, the first one, we, we used a, um, a modified proprietary chassis and chopped it about quite a lot. But it, it, it's, um, it's a tubular steel chassis. Mm. Um, but we wanted to do a proper job on the production car, so we've got uh, you know, absolutely state-of-the-art aluminium and carbon fibre um, bonded chassis. Um, the um, body, um, we got the initial shape really by eye and by hand, um, and then we scanned that, um, corrected all the surfaces. Um, we've increased dimensions in certain areas to, to make it uh, e even more accommodating than it is. Mm. So as you, as you say, I mean, we're, we're starting the, the actual build of it week after next, and uh, um, it should be about two months to, to get something. Exciting times. Uh, so you're gonna uh, show me around them? Oh, yeah, the I'll, key, I'll take you around it a bit. Yeah, yeah. certainly, yeah. All right. Well, it sure is pretty. I think so, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> it's really <laughs> stunning. So should we start at the front and yeah. sort of work our way back? Because okay. the front, is a, it's a striking front. It's, it's got a beautiful and very low nose. It is very low um, compared to the original, yeah. But I, I suppose a general comment is that uh, although this isn't a particularly big car, if you, certainly if you compared it to a modern supercar, it, it, it's quite, you know, quite compact. Um, if you take an original M1A, an M1A is tiny. And yeah. uh, comparing it, an M1A with a Lotus Elise, for example, an Elise is bigger in every dimension. So it's, it's wider, um, the wheelbase is longer. The an only Elise. one, an Elise, yeah. The only one that isn't is the, is the nose. And mm. as you say, it's got a long, you know, very low nose, whereas the Elise is quite um, stubby. Um, but other than that, it, it is smaller um, than an, a Lotus Elise. So yeah, you, you, you mentioned the nose. Um, that was um, one of the things that we were doing was to try and overcome um, the lift that the original would have had. The original nose would have been, I should think, six inches higher than this particular one. So it was sort of a, a pointed effect, whereas we wanted to get it mm. low and hunched down. And that, uh, that obviously gives it a more modern look, mm. but um, aerodynamically it works much better. Yeah. And, and we were surprised. We went into the um, wind tunnel at Myra straight out of the box we were showing zero lift at the front which was really surprising Happy days, yeah because really you don't good. want lift there no definitely <laughs> not definitely not we ended up with net downforce but uh, it, it was much better originally initially yeah. than we expected it to be yeah um the profile of the wings i mean we're about four inches wider aside so eight mm. inches across in total and pretty well all of that is in the arches, is, is across the top of the wheels. So mm. we can get um, more modern rubber underneath, but more than that, it, it does give it this sort of punched and aggressive look. It does have a lovely sweep over the, over yeah. the front wings and over the it rear. It does, yes, the yeah, on the back. yeah. And, and all this we created from scratch. This wasn't on the M1A. Yeah, nice bare, bare minimalist interior. The, the two standouts for me on that interior, the instrument binnacle cluster, mm -hmm. Is, is quite a statement and the gear lever is just lovely. Yeah, well we tried, as you say, it, part of it is, is that it, it is minimal, it is stripped out and, and, and it's, it is purely functional, but we did want to be able to display um, a bit of flair and engineering where we could. So um, yeah, the um, instrument binnacle, that's machined from a solid piece of aluminium for example. Um, on the next one, um, we're 
incorporating the door opening into the um, gear lever blister. Yeah. And that again is a, is a machine piece in the same way. Nice. That that is, so that everything, there might not be an awful lot going on in the interior, but the bits that you do see and that are there, they, they are, they're going to be done to a beautiful standard. I know it's a cliche, but it's a race car for the road, right? So it is, just, it is, know. yeah. I mean, the gear, the gear lever, I mean, that's, it's nice having that to change on the right. And uh, um, the, uh, the, the story of the gear knob is uh, interesting. We, we've had a number of ex-McLaren people involved on the project. And uh, one of the things that we were doing on this particular development car was trying to get a nice precision feel to the gear change because the gearbox is situated right at the very back of the car. Um, I, I dropped it off there for him to do some work on, on it and picked it up uh, a few days later and it came with this gold top gear, knee, gear knob mm. on top of the stick and, um, and it certainly wasn't there when it went to him so I said, oh, yes, what's, what's, the, what's, what's the story of the gear knob? And he said, well, I've had that in my toolkit, he said, for about 30 years, and I've been looking for the right opportunity, the right place to put it. And I said, well, what's, what, what is it then? And he said, he said it's off Ayrton Senna's 1989 Monaco Grand Prix winning car. <laughs> and yeah, and, and they used to, they, they used to, in, in those days, um, wow. they would pretty well rebuild the complete car, you know, between races. And this apparently had a slight, I mean, I haven't been able to find it, but it had a slight scratch on the titanium coating and uh, that was enough to consign it to the to the waste paper bin but uh, he grabbed it and uh, we've, got, wow. we've got it now so it's uh, it's that's, a nice story and, and we, cool story. We'll, we'll be copying that on um, yeah. subsequent cars so there'll be uh, yeah so it's quite a nice feeling you know, we, yeah. you, know you, you talk to steve about Ayrton and santa and uh, you know you going along and you, every time you change gear you think god oh, that's the that's, santa's hand was on that gear yeah now, <laughs> on that now, gear knob now, surely in this film, I'm going to get Steve on camera and, and have a chat to him about his history in motorsport and yeah. his association with, with Ayrton Senna. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's really very cool. Yeah. Um, and then tell me, what, a, what about the options for engine then? Because firstly, I think that looks amazing, just popping up yeah. the bodywork yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, it, it starts off as a, um, as a Chevrolet V8 of the sort that they would put in um, Corvettes um, over the years. And this particular one um, is an LS2 engine. Um, the one that we're building in the next car is an LS7, which is a full seven litres. Um, and um, in the form that we'll be using it, because we, we, we put a few modifications on and uh, it'll be doing about 610, 620 brake horsepower. Wow. Um, this one is doing 510. I think from wow. from memory, um, and it's 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 you don't you don't feel to be honest that you think oh, fuel only... injected or carbureted. Uh, it's fuel injected, yeah. um, and it's got our own um, well, it's got our, um, throttle bodies on it. So t br briefly, tell me about the, some of the guys in the team that you've got mm. you've assembled because it, it's a it's a a team with some proper credibility. It is, and and, <laughs> and and how did you get them all on board? Where you, well, you must know, you must have a very good black book. We yeah, and and yes, we we, we know some good people, and um, and they know good people as well. So, uh, and and the, we've also found that when people do start getting involved, they they start doing an awful lot more than they thought they were going to be doing in the first place, just because they get taken over and, and within the enthusiasm for the project. So the body shell I did with a company called Bam D and they were great at interpreting ideas and coming up with some of their own. And uh, that, that was to produce this initial car. Over this particular car, the next one um, has about 50 mil more in the wheelbase. So there's more room for um, taller drivers and there's more width um, across the footwell area, so you have more room around your feet. Mm -hmm. um, and the chassis for that um, is an aluminium and carbon fibre structure. It's produced in conjunction with a company um, down in Worcester, um, set up by um, the individual who used to run uh, Hydra and uh, Hydra produced the chassis for Lotus and, and he was the main consultant when Aston went to aluminium construction and I think when the same thing happened with Jaguar so he's, he's wow. of all the people in the world getting involved in aluminium construction mm. um, he's probably the leading guy. 
So important question. Mm. I want to buy one. Yep. So what's, what's the, I mean, I'm guessing you'll pretty much do anything that I want in terms of colors. And yeah, absolutely anything. And yes. Very I mean, much. A, any, anything a from anything from spending um, probably a good morning being molded for your own seat and uh, um, and then any choice of trim that you want, um, any uh, any combination of engine performance. I mean, the um, we're putting a seven liter engine in the next one, um, and we're we think that you know well, six hundred and fifty brake horsepower is is more than anyone is likely to need. But if you wanted more than that, yeah. it's certainly it's, not a problem. I mean, because it is yeah. quite heavy, isn't it? at 900 kilos You'd have, where yeah, are the yeah. tether points to tie it down in a strong breeze <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it's that's about what it's like i mean it is for a modern it, day, yeah modern it, day it, it, it's it's low as a lease light yeah. they may be a bit lighter than an elise with Wowzers. four times the power yeah. over the standard one yeah so i'll put all the details mm. uh for nickels cars in the um in the description below um and obviously you know get in touch with the guys if you are if you're interested but uh, uh, this video series to kind of track the progress mm. and find out more i'm dying to find out more about the construction of the chassis i'm dying yeah. to find out more about just the the, the suspension setup talking off yeah. camera there's some really exciting stuff that's true there. the suspension guy again it was somebody that uh, we got involved and uh, he was uh, loaded as his top guy until about three years ago and uh, in, ironically well not, Ironic, he'd also worked with Ayrton Senna when loaders were running active ride wow. on Formula One. He, he'd had experience with him too. So wow. That's another Senna connection. <laughs> through him a, and there's, Steve. Still, there's a lot of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for your time, John. Ne Pleasure. Next up, we're going to grab hold of Steve and, uh, yeah. and just and ask him a few questions about, about his background and thoughts. But um, stay tuned for, these, uh, to, for the rest of this video, but also just to follow the progress. And I can't wait to see the next one. And to, Good. Thank you very uh, the, much. The bit I'm yeah. really excited about is yeah. hearing it. Yep. It's going to make a good noise, right? It makes a fantastic <laughs> noise. Yeah. Yeah. Now then, guys, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Nichols. You are the name on the front of that car behind us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I've got so much I'd love to talk to you about and, and a limited amount of time. Sure. But can we kind of start for... Um, for everybody, just to kind of understand your backstory in motorsport, and I guess before that, maybe even in just the carbon fibre work you did when you're in the aerospace industry. Yeah, sure. I uh, well, I graduated from university. My first job was at um, Hercules, uh, designing and doing uh, stress analysis, that sort of thing, on rocket motors for the Trident submarine-based uh, missile system. Uh, those rocket motors are made primarily out of fiberglass and carbon fiber reinforcements, so not a lot of metal in them. So yeah, yeah. that was my introduction really to high-tech uh, analysis, aerospace sort of work, composite materials, including and, carbon and, fiber. And I guess nowadays carbon fiber is a buzzword we use all the time, but back then it was a super secret material no one really knew even existed, let it, alone it, it was pretty much only used in aerospace by, yeah. by companies uh, like Hercules, you know, yeah. aer aerospace sort of projects. Yeah. And then you moved into Formula One? Uh, yeah, I, I got a job, first of all, in um, doing dampers, my introduction to sort of professional racing dampers for Gabriel, uh, for um, Indy cars and off-road cars and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I met uh, John Barnard there doing dampers for his uh, Vels Parnelli Jones Indy cars and the and the Chaparral Indy car, mm -hmm. uh, and so when he returned to England and started work on uh, a Formula One car for Project Four, I contacted him uh, looking for a job, yeah, because I did kind of want to be involved in uh, in Formula One, yeah. So that turned out uh, he said he was uh, building a car for Project Four, designing a car for Project Four, and. He wanted to use, this is in the days of ground effects, like they've just gone back to in yeah. Formula One. And so it was advantageous to have a narrow monocoque and wide aerodynamic side parts. And, but he didn't want to sacrifice stiffness. So he said he was looking to make a narrow, mono, a narrow stiff monocoque out of innovative new materials. And I said, well, that'll be carbon fiber then. Yeah. And he said, well, yeah, since you've 
guessed. <laughs> yeah. How did you know that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so the problem is they couldn't find anybody that'd make it for him. You know, he was ambitious at the time, mm. quite visionary and brave of, of mm. Barno to do that. And nobody was doing anything like making a whole Formula One monocoque out of mm. carbon fiber. And I said, well, you know, I used to work at Hercules, and, and I know that they're interested in expanding the use of carbon fiber. I'm pretty sure they'd be pretty interested in this because it's a global exposure with Formula One and, mm. and it would be an ideal platform for their goal of trying to expand the use of carbon fiber in other areas. Mm. So I contacted Hercules, some of my old colleagues there, and indeed they were interested. And so I gave the details to Ron. Dennis and uh, John Barnard, and they immediately made an appointment to go to Salt wow. Lake City and, uh, and see these people. Wow. And eventually they were able to uh, conclude a, a deal for Hercules to manufacture the basic components, the shell and the bulkheads, and then they would be shipped to England and we'd do the final assembly here, bonding the bulkheads in place and mm. making the finished, uh, finished monocle. Wow. And that started a carbon fiber revolution in Formula One that Oh yeah, change, well, the, change the sport completely. Sure, you see now. I mean, I don't know. Everything's made out of carbon fiber, <laughs> so, so it's literally uh, everything. Yeah, yeah. That must have been a really exciting time to be involved in the sport with a with a such a cutting edge new thing. Were you aware at the time of any other teams doing it, or did you know that you were pretty much? There, there were a couple of teams that had done a few little bits and pieces out of carbon, yeah. but nothing like a whole monocon. Uh, in parallel, about the same time, Lotus were doing a carbon monocot, but it was a much different concept. Mm. The, uh, the McLaren uh, monocot was really very high tech, leading edge sort of stuff. Uh, it was made mostly out of unidirectional carbon, which is just the plain flat fibers uh, mm. impregnated, pre-impregnated with, with resin. Uh, and that way they're not bent into a woven cloth which uses up a lot of the strength of the carbon by, by bending it in the weaving mm -hmm. process. And, uh, the Lotus thing was a more low-tech alternative. Uh, it, they used a woven fabric that was a combination of, of carbon and Kevlar in flat sheets. Uh, and then they would uh, machine V-shaped grooves into it and fold it up sort of origami style and mm. then bond ac across the joint on the inside. Wow. And, Bulk bulkheads in and things. So yeah. it was quite a good effort, but but not really the leading edge stuff that the that the McLaren uh, was. So. Wow! And then it, I mean, we're, we're kind of cutting your your immense career down uh, into a shorter time frame. But let's bring forward a few years. Um, MP44. I can't not talk to you yeah. about being responsible for the most successful Formula One car mm -hmm. of all time and working with Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost. That must have been. A, a special thing. Can you sort of talk to us about that for a little bit? Well, you know, at the time, I suppose it, 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 I didn't have time to appreciate it, maybe. Yeah. Looking back on it, I guess it was pretty special. But, uh, you know, I was working at McLaren, major Formula One team at the time, and um, I'd been helpful in getting John's concept manufactured by introducing someone that was willing to take that project on. and. Mm. And I got a job at uh, Project 4, which later turned into to McLaren International. And so as a major Formula 1 team, you know, we had a, we had a, a big budget. Um, Ron was very good at getting sponsors. And, and um, John Barnard left at the end of 1986, and Ron appointed me as the, as the chief designer. And, and uh, so... You know, in a situation, it's, it's a major Formula One team with a big budget. I, I remember saying to Ron, you know, what can I do? How much money can I spend? And, mm. you know, <laughs> he just said to me, you just make the car go fast. And that, that's, I, that's all you need, right? Yeah, and if I, if I can't keep up on the finance, I'll, well, come and let you know. Wow. Well, he never came and let me know, so it, no. it was no budgetary restrictions. Right? When, when, in the development of that car, did you realize, was there a light bulb moment where you think, this is a fast car? Uh, I never really had time to think that, I guess. Yeah. You know, as like I say, now it seems a bit special, but at the time you're so focused on just getting the job done and you're under such 
time constraints and so much pressure. You, you just all you're thinking about is getting on with the, getting on with the job. You know. Mm. So we um, John had left, and it gave us the opportunity as a, as a design team to to come out from under his shadow, so to speak, and do some of the things that we wanted to do. And, and so we started off with the MP43 the, the year before, and uh, the rules had changed quite a lot. Uh, the fuel tank was smaller, so we were able to make the whole car more compact. Mm. And we made that car as, as compact as we could with the components that we had to work with, the tag turbo engine that mm -hmm. was made by Porsche. And, uh, so th we did what we could, but but we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew, and so uh, there was a lot more left that we could do, and which is saving for next year, you might yeah. say. So the four four followed on from that, uh, and it was really the same design principles, the, the same ethos or concept or whatever. Make make the car the best you can with the components that you've got to work with. Make it small, make it compact, make it aerodynamic, make it efficient make it stiff, light, all of those sort of things. Mm -hmm. And with another year to think about it, and, uh, and we had different components now to work with, Honda had come on board. Uh, they had a smaller, more compact engine that was made possible by the, the tilt and carbon multi-plate clutch, which was smaller in diameter, meant the whole engine could be lower. Fuel tank size had been further reduced to 150 liters, so that could be more compact. And then to keep the driver within the profile of the low fuel tank and the low uh, engine, we, we laid him down a bit so that his shoulders were within the profile of, the, uh, of those other components. So same design principles, principles as the 4.3, it's just that we had a smaller engine, a smaller fuel tank to work with, so the whole thing was, and was more compact. It, it's such a clean, pretty car. I mean, modern day Formula 1 cars are they got kicks and flicks and bits of air all over them. Back then there was just nothing. And, and I know we're here to talk about yeah. um, the car behind us. And it's the same kind of ethos here, right? It's, it's clean and low and yeah. sleek. And it, well, yeah, the 4-4, the it's, it, it's very simple, really. And at the time it was quite leading edge, but, yeah. but we had less tools to work with, supercomputers and, and mm. all of that sort of thing. And, and so it was much harder to design and manufacture all these weird and wonderful shapes. And we didn't have, uh, we didn't have uh, as much resources into the aerodynamics. Mm. You know, the total technical staff at the time was, was 17 people, designers, race engineers. For the whole car? Well, not just for that car, but for the we had to do, we had to do the MP43, and then we had to do an MP43B to put the uh, to put the the uh, Honda engine in the back wow. of the old car. Then we had to do the MP44. <laughs> then we had to do the MP44B with the V10 engine in it, and then we had to do the proper MP45. So. All those cars oh. in about 18 months with 17 people. Because the modern day Formula One team's got like five, oh. six, seven, eight hundred people. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's uh, amazing. Uh, Absolutely Mercedes, amazing. Mercedes, people like that, their, yeah. their staff will be close to 2,000 people yeah. and the drawing office will be 200 instead of 17. So there just wasn't the resources to do as much as they do now. Uh, but in principle, it was the same. We, you know, yeah. we did as much as we could with the resources we had, with the people we had. Uh, with the budget we, we had, so, but the principle is the same. Do the best you can with the resources that you've got. Wow. Can you talk to me a bit about Ayrton Senna? The, 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 the closest I ever got to Ayrton Senna, I was at Donington for that magical race where he started in sixth and ended up the first lap in first. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and uh, something, something otherworldly happened that day, I think, and most people who were there, who were there you know, and I've now subsequently raced at Donington, and I still don't understand how he managed to do what he did. But what was he like as a person? What was he? Well, he, what was he, the man behind the kind of public? He public was. Image? He was uh, obviously an extremely good racing driver, otherworldly, say, yeah. and, and he was like that. But so was Prost, and mm. so was Loud, and you know, these guys are like they came from another planet because they are so good. So everybody knows all of that. 
the other thing about Ayrton which um, stands out more to me, I mean I worked with him on the technical side trying to make the car go faster and we had a very symbiotic sort of relationship, you know, to, to develop the car, him driving, telling telling me about it and me making changes and you know that, that relationship worked very well and so the, we were able to make the car go fast. But thinking back on it now, what stands out for me is the humanity of the of the man. Mm -hmm. uh, how he treated me, you know, he was very kindly towards me. In stark contrast to the way he was with his competitors, which was fierce, yes, you know, merciless, or even yeah. journalists, you know, he didn't have a lot of time. And so he kind of had this hard exterior that he showed to the world. But for somebody like me, that was important to him and was helping him to achieve his goals, he was very kindly. Wow. Wanted to share it with you, you know, that, that sort of thing. So uh, that magnificent. And and the charity stuff that he did, uh, did him anonymously in Brazil and yeah. all that. He was you know, really decent guy inside. No, oh, that's lovely to hear. I mean, he just, he, 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 one of these sports people that transcend sport, I think, and there are very few of them if you look back through history in yeah. whatever sport you look at, uh, be it a, a Federer in tennis or a Jack Nicholas in golf or, you know, yeah. uh, to, to hear someone who actually knew him is very cool. And I guess the really cool thing about anyone who's going to be buying one of these is they'll, They'll have the person who helped set up <laughs> Senna's race car help them yeah. set up their own. Yeah, well. Um, and they, well which, which is just the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me want to buy one right now. Well, I, uh, you know, I started my Formula One career with McLaren and, and I subsequently worked for several other Formula One teams, but it, it's always a, a soft spot for McLaren with mm -hmm. me. Uh, you know, your first love sort of thing, uh, I suppose. And, uh, so this was an interesting project in that um, it was John Minot's uh, idea yeah. uh, and the original McLaren, the McLaren Elva M1A was Bruce McLaren's first car. Mm. So, you know, for me as sort of a McLaren man of old, uh, it was, it was kind of nice <laughs> to do something that visually uh, yeah. it takes its styling uh, cues from, from his original. So tell me about the N1A. And well, what uh, inspiration that draws from the M1A and, and the the N, N1A has a lot of styling cues, as I say. The yeah. the shape is quite similar. It's uh, it's been made wider, which makes it look a little more modern, a little more aggressive, and allows uh, wider tires. It, it's a track day car, so it'll be road legal, but it's more towards the track end of the scale than the road mm -hmm. end of the scale. And, yeah, I think there's nowhere, somebody, nowhere to put the shopping. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I suppose if you don't take a passenger, you could stick a <laughs> bit in there. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it'll be more at home on the track. Yeah. So sta standout features for you about the car in terms of? Well, the body shape, as you see, it, like I said, it's, it's, the styling cues are based on the N1A. Underneath, there are more modern uh, features. It's, um, it's got a bonded aluminium uh, chassis like Lotus use on several of their cars. The people that develop that chassis for them have, have done the same mm -hmm. for us. It's got a um, an American V8 engine. Uh, th this one has an LS2 engine in it, uh, which is kind of in keeping with the, the Can-Am cars of, yeah. of the era of the, of the M1A. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's been breathed on a bit, camshafts and uh, the uh, fuel injection, the individual throttle bodies, and, uh, but, but that engine is, is pretty impressive. And put that through a six-speed transmission with the shifter on the right, I noticed, <laughs> yeah, that, which yeah. is just, again, another nod to motorsport yeah. heritage. It, I, I love it, that. It's going to, it'll weigh, we don't know what the final version is going to be, but, which is just in the process of happening now. Yeah. Uh, but it'll be 900, maybe 880 kilos, and this one has uh, about 520 or 530 horsepower. Wow! So the, the next one is going to have an LS7 engine, and it'll have about 600 horsepower. So that will uh, keep you honest. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> my fear is it's too much power, really, and uh, 
the customers will have to There'll be people out on the internet it. going, there's no such thing as too much power. <laughs> and believe me, 600 plus horsepower in a, in a 900 kilo well, car, that's, that's... I don't want to frighten the life out of the customers. Sensational. So. So we'll have to introduce them to it gradually, I think, and we, we want them all to take a, a, a driving course with a, yeah. on the track with a, with a professional oh, racing like a, driver. Like know, a very so. good idea. And do we have, uh, have you been kind? Are there any driver aids on the car? Yeah. No. Traction control? Uh, I think we will introduce... ABS? Driver aids. Power steering? <laughs> we, took, we had power steering on it, but we took it off. Uh, yeah. Better feel. Yeah. And, uh, we, I think we will eventually introduce uh, traction control that's the, to that's aid this, the, that's this leg, to aid the customer. Yeah. Well, it should, should be. But <laughs> the, the people buying this aren't necessarily going to be experienced race car drivers, yeah, so yeah. it'll it'll help them. And gradually, as they get used to the car, maybe they can switch off some of the electronic uh, controls. We've also um, uh, tweaked the you know, all the suspension has been uh, carefully looked at. We've uh, we've introduced a sort of suspension guru to the project who who worked a lot with uh, Lotus mm -hmm. and worked a lot with uh, the legendary Lotus development driver John Miles. So he's he's uh, given us his inspiration on the on the suspension. And, uh, so overall, it, it should handle well and have plenty of power and be quite lightweight. And well, we look forward to following the progress. We're going to be doing videos on the suspension um, that we were just talking about. We're also going to have a look at the technology in the chassis because the kind of bonded extruded aluminium chassis, mm. um, I just think for, for me that the engineer in me starts to kind of light up when you start yeah. talking about really cool stuff. Oh, like that. And then yeah. I'm really looking forward to the shakedown and seeing the, because yeah. it's obviously the development car and the, 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 the next version is going to change yeah. quite a bit from this in terms of yeah it'll it'll, it'll look quite the same but yeah. it, it's under the skin but underneath it'll, it'll be uh, the mechanical components yeah. are all different and uh, more modernized and well so steve yeah. it's been an absolute oh, i could honestly could talk to you <laughs> forever we could just go down the pub and get a nice <laughs> nice jar of beer and just sit and talk yeah. talk motorsport um but it's been an absolute honor to meet you and um i'm just fascinated about the car the heritage mm. of the car um as i said you know to to, to buy a car that's got the the project team around it with the the kind of CVs that are in yeah. in with you lot is is quite something. Well, it's been an interesting uh, project. Steve, thank you so much for your sure. time. Sure. Okay. Um, very very special. And, uh, th <laughs> thanks for yeah. thanks for talking to us about the car. Sure. Brilliant. Okay. Well, what a fascinating day it's been here with Nichols Cars and the N1A, a very very special vehicle and a really special team behind the car as well. Fascinating to hear from John about the whole project and where it came from. An idea turned into reality and then to spend time talking to Steve about his career in motorsport, his time with Ayrton Senna and the development of such iconic cars as the MP44 was truly very special. But this car, and I think the development of it, I can't wait to make the next couple of videos. We're going to have a, a really good look at the chassis that's going to sit underneath the new car and the technology behind that. We're going to have a really good look at the suspension because the suspension on this car is something pretty special and the team involved in that are as well. And just sitting in this prototype, it, the view is like nothing else I've ever seen over the, the two bulges of the front wheels. I mean, you're going to be able to place every single apex, hit every apex perfectly. And I'm sure the induction noise from that engine behind me will be absolutely insane. But please stay tuned for the rest of the videos in this series. But if you've enjoyed that one, please give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come. A huge thanks to all the guys at Nichols Cars for inviting me to be part of this project. It really is very, very special. All their details are in the description below. But I'll see you on the next film, guys. You take care. Drive safe.